I, I just want to tell a story that I experienced today, this afternoon, as a matter of fact. I'm still amazed by it. But anyway, <clears throat> for years I've been telling the truth, and it offends Christians, okay? They don't want to believe. They believe lies all their lives. And so rather than believing the truth, they want to kill the messenger. So because I have for over a decade, 13 to 15 years now, I've told the truth incessantly everywhere I go by any and every means, the Christians retaliated and got us kicked out of our house. So we came up with a tiny little down payment, and we bought all the only thing we could afford, this little cracker box we live in, little bitty dinky house. I think it's 844 square feet. <clears throat> and, uh, but that's all there is. There's no outbuildings or anything. I don't have a garage. I don't have a workbench. I don't have a place to work on anything. I mean, my, my workbench is the kitchen table, okay? If I want to come in out of the rain or, or the hot beating sun to fix something that's broke, I have to do it in the kitchen, okay? And so... And I can't afford to build a building, so I was perusing Craigslist to find a, a building that I could tear down or something so I could build a shed to put my things in, my bench, a workbench. And I answered an ad on Craigslist for a, what turned out to be a little farrowing house where they used to, you know, the farmers buy these little modular sheds that they put together. And then they uh, farrow sows. They, they put sows, hogs, in there to have their babies. And it stunk like most hog farrowing houses do. But I need a shed. And so I answered the ad. I went out and looked at the building. And uh, it was cheap enough, more than I can afford, but it was cheap enough. And uh, I told him, I said, well, it needs a lot of repair to make it suitable for what I'm going to do with it. And uh, I, I just need the roof not to leak. I can't put my belongings in there. Have anyway, we got beyond discussion about the building and we started to talking about the world and the condition of the world and, and what's happening in the world and the country particularly. And of, and, of course, I asked him, I said, well, you've heard of the New World Order, haven't you? Oh, yeah, I've heard about it. I said, has anybody ever told you what it is? Well, now, come to think of it, no. I said, well, I'm going to tell you. In 30 minutes, I'm going to tell you what the New World Order is. And I said, it's the most marvelous thing you've ever heard in your life. And if you will just believe me enough to investigate it yourself, You'll see it for yourself. The information's not hidden. It's available on the Internet. I said, let me just start by telling you that the New World Order is simply the restoration of the Old World Order. And, of course, never hearing the term Old World Order before, he looked at me like I had two or three heads, which I'm accustomed to. So I taught him. I told him, I said, all I have to do is explain to you what the old world order was, and then you'll automatically know what the new world order is. Okay, he said. I said, the old world order was governed by one man. One man ruled all of Europe. And of course, you can about imagine the expression on his face, a man that had had gone to the public school system and had never heard a word about any of this. A man who had never been churched in his life, which turned out to be to my advantage in this discussion. And I said, literally, one man ruled all of Europe. All of the known world was ruled by one man. And that was the papacy. And he picked all the kings of the earth. And if any king rebelled against the papacy and governed his country contrary to Roman Catholic canon law, the Pope would just close all the churches, which were all Catholic churches, by the way. So Catholics couldn't get married. They couldn't have their babies baptized. 
they couldn't have a Christian burial. I mean, if the Pope closed the churches, heaven was literally shut up. And it was a desperate endeavor by every quote-unquote Christian during the old world order to do whatever the Pope wanted to get those churches open back up. And so they'd overthrow their king, and the Pope would appoint a new one. And that's how it went throughout all of Europe. Now, if you rebelled personally against the Pope, so you didn't believe what the Pope taught, you wouldn't bend the knee to the Pope and worship him like a god, or you wouldn't obey him like the king of kings, then you were persecuted singularly, and you were brought into the Inquisition. Have you ever heard of the Inquisition? Well, yeah. Do you know anything about it? No. Then I told him what, what basically what we talked about today in this broadcast. This is how the Pope and the king who ruled the country in which you live, that's how they tortured you to get you to come into obeyance, obeyance to the papacy and to the government, your papally elected government. You weren't allowed to buy or sell. Nobody would sell you anything. They took all your money and you couldn't buy anything. They call it economic sanctions today like the United States did to, to uh, heretic Iraq. We wouldn't let Iraq buy anything or sell anything. They enforced the sanctions with smart bombs and F-16s and F-14s and F-111s and B-52 bombers and satellite weaponry, and Iraq couldn't buy or sell. They did that to individuals during the old world order. And if anybody tried to help you, tried to feed you, tried to give you a glass of water, they'd simply chain that individual to you, and together you were persecuted by everybody. They literally would chain you together, and you would suffer the same persecutions as the heretic if you tried to help one. That's how it was in the old world order. Economic sanctions persecution by starvation and deprivation and any other kind of torture. And as a matter of fact, if if you were excommunicated from the church and, and heralded a heretic, then the church took your property and they took your wife and made her a nun. They took your children, put them in a, a, a nunnery and made them Roman Catholics and they took your land. The church took your land. And if anybody turned you in for being a heretic, went to the Holy Office of the Inquisition, said, hey, my neighbor's a heretic, the Inquisition would come, take the property, torture the man or the woman, and even the children if it was necessary to get a confession. And outside of that, they, they were excommunicated from the church. That means they're all their private property, their money, their wealth, everything belonged then to the church. And for turning you in, the guy that turned you in got to manage your property for the church. And that's how the Roman Catholic Church got so powerful. It controlled at least, at the very least, a third of the tillable land of all of Europe because of so many heretics. And don't you know every country that the United States destroys in war, we literally own the country. And we establish its government. And that government serves the papacy. Now, they don't tell you this in the schools. They don't tell you this in the seminaries. They don't tell you this in the churches. But I'm telling you, this history is not hard to find. All you have to do is have the courage to look into it. What the old world order is, was, is the new world order only on a global scale. It's all about religion, buddy. It's all about who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve Christ or the Antichrist? Are you going to serve Jesus Christ or are you going to serve his counterfeit? The papacy. 
Are you going to obey God and his holy laws, or are you going to obey the papacy and Roman Catholic canon law as implemented by the civil laws of every government in this world? That's the choice you've got to make. I said, if you'll understand what I just told you, you'll understand everything that happens in the world. And, you know, I promised that I would tell this kid in 30 minutes what the New World Order was. It went on for an hour, and the kid literally followed me down the driveway as I tried to leave. He couldn't get enough. Suddenly, for the first time in his life, a man had compassion upon him and told him the truth. And he received it with gladness. I sat there and I watched his face light up. He got it. So far as I know, the kid had never been churched in his life. When I left, he realized that everyone had lied to him. The schools had lied to him. The mainstream media had lied to him. The government of the United States had lied to him. His, if he ever went to church, his church lied to him. And he was hearing the truth for the first time in all of his life. And as hideous and ugly as that truth, his face just shone. He couldn't get enough. He followed me down the driveway. And he'd have followed me all the way to town if I hadn't drove so fast. But you know, I don't get that kind of reception from church, churched Christians. They would rather believe a lie. They would rather believe the lies that they've been taught all their life. You know something? This unchurched fellow, I'll tell you, I told him, here and now I'm going to tell you precisely where they got the New World Order. It's Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Here's how it goes. And he caused the sacrifice and the oblations to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. Now, I told him, we who know the scriptures know that it was Jesus Christ who fulfilled that prophecy completely and perfectly 2,000 years ago. He caused the sacrifices and the oblations to cease when he gave up his life on the cross. And the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. That means that it was unlawful to make any more animal sacrifices because that ceremony of animal sacrifice could not occur were that veil not in place between the holy and the most holy place. God literally put an end to animal sacrifices by simply ripping the veil of the temple. And the scripture makes it plain that it was ripped from top to bottom, not bottom to top. That means God ripped it because no man could reach the top of the thing. And no man was strong enough to rip it. It was a heavy, heavy piece of fabric. And this is recorded in the Bible. And he shall cause the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. Why did he cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease? Because he became the sacrifice. Now, to perform any more animal sacrifices is to repudiate him as the Lamb of God. All of Protestants have known the truth about that prophecy. But that's not what we believe today. We believe that the he spoken of there is the Antichrist, and he comes off in the distant future. But before they can fulfill this sacrifice, there has to be a nation state of Israel, there has to be Jews living in the land, there has to be a temple, and there has to be, gum, there has to be animal sacrifices. Again, I mean, you can't cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease unless the sacrifices and oblations are ongoing. And that's when the, his face lit up. I told him, I said, that's why they created the nation state of Israel. That's why they persecuted the Jews in the First and Second World Wars, to make them want to flee anywhere to get away from the persecution. And they had little Israel all ready for them. The Balfour Declaration, 
Yeah. Rome prepared a place for the Jews and then persecuted them to make them go there. Now with Jews in the land and being pounded by the, 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 the so-called Palestinians, which are funded both by the United States and other so-called Christian nations, they want their temple. They're ready to build a temple. They're ready to begin their animal sacrifices again because they think that's their salvation. When they rejected Jesus, and his face lit up again. Believe it or not, I don't think the kid had ever been churched in his life, but he knew a little bit, or he wouldn't have comprehended what I said. I said the First World War and the Second World War was to persecute Protestants, Orthodox, and Jews. The Second World War was to persecute Protestants, Orthodox, and Jews. The current world war is to persecute Protestants, Orthodox, Jews, and Muslims. And he got it. And I said it's the United States government that it's doing this. And they don't serve us. They serve the papacy. And here you've been taught in schools and everywhere else, the mainstream media, every form of education and information in this country, all of it, has taught you that we fight our wars to preserve the sovereignty and the liberty of our country. But that's not the truth. We have fought all the wars to restore the papacy to complete spiritual and temporal power in the world, just like he enjoyed before the Protestant Reformation. I said, Do you, have you ever heard about the Protestant Reformation? You know what that's all about? No. I told him, I said, in the old world order, the, the priests of the Roman Catholic Church were the only ones who could read the Bible. It was written in Latin. The people couldn't read Latin. But eventually, people began to translate the Bible from Latin into the regular languages of the people so that they could read the Bible for themselves. And when they did, they read all the prophecies in the Bible about the Antichrist, and they recognized it was the papacy. So all of a sudden, they realized the Pope's not the vicar of Christ on the earth. He's Antichrist. He is the Antichrist of Scripture. Therefore, to obey him means we reject Christ. And to obey his king means we reject Christ. We give up our liberty in Christ, whereby he hath said, made us free, and we've become bond, bound again by the European Pharaoh called the Pope and all of his kings in Europe. And guess what? All the land of Europe, one-third of the tillable land of Europe that was confiscated by the Roman Catholic Church, taken away from the Bible-believing Christians called heretics, that land now belongs to us, not the Pope. He stole it. Filthy lucre. He stole it all on the pretense that he was Christ's replacement on the earth. We know better now. So they took all the land back from the papacy and starved the Roman Catholic Church from all of its wealth. Then they overthrow their governments and put in people who are Protestant in faith, who believed it's in the scriptures and the liberty of the people. No more did they serve the papacy. No more did they enslave the people. No more did they keep them in ignorance. And finally, they were liberated. They got to reap the benefit of their own land. They got to send their kids to colleges in school so they could read the Bible for themselves, and they were confirmed in their belief that the papacy was the Antichrist of the Bible. And that was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. It liberated all of Europe and nearly starved the papacy, nearly destroyed the Roman Catholic Church. That's not what they believe today. They believe in a future Antichrist that's going to come in Israel and caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And when they did that, they literally exonerated the papacy. 
The Protestant Reformation was an error, a gross error against the legitimate throne of God on the earth, the papacy. And so, having made this grievous error against the papacy, now it is the jurisdiction or the, or the calling of the Protestant nations now, having repudiated Protestantism, believing in a future Antichrist, exonerating the papacy now to restore not only what was lost to the papacy during the Protestant Reformation, but to conquer the rest of the world for the Pope. And I saw the guy's eyes light completely up. Now he got it. He got it all. He comprehended it all. Never being churched before, never hearing the truth from the schools, the pulpits, the, the newspapers, the press, never hearing the truth before. And when he said, when he, when he finally comprehended, I said, are you getting this? He says, this makes more sense than anything I've ever seen in my life. Makes more sense than anything I've ever read in my life, ever heard in my life. And the kid literally followed me down the driveway. The look on his face was heavenly. As far as I know, he was never a Christian ever in his life, but he is today. I could tell by the look on his face. Now he has hope in the Jesus he never knew. And he knows who his counterfeit is. And he knows he can't serve two masters. Why is it so difficult to open the eyes of quote-unquote Christians? I'll tell you why. This kid was never churched in his life. He'd never been instructed in lies all of his life. And he was free to accept the church. So if you're having trouble in your family, in your friends, understanding this new world order, they don't understand Romanism and the Reformation. Maybe it's because they've been so steeped in futurism, this idea that Antichrist doesn't come to the future, and the papacy is just a spiritual leader in the world and no threat to God's people at all. Maybe it's time to quit talking to them and go talk to a perfectly ignorant individual, as I did today. Because if the Protestants want to forget their Protestantism, if they want to repudiate Jesus Christ and worship Antichrist, then Jesus will raise up stones to worship him. Unbelievers, let the stones cry out. That's all I have today. I haven't eaten a thing all day. The Lord has blessed me. I got to tell the truth to somebody who was willing to listen. And I'm blessed more than anybody you ever saw in your life. Now I'm hungry, and I got to go eat something, and then I got to go back to work. Pray for me. Pray for yourselves that you find the courage to tell somebody, anybody, even a stone, because the stones will cry out. If God's people want to believe lies, then let the stones praise him.